it's time for us to get started. We are in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we have, uh, let's see, we've been considering this fourth discourse of Jesus, um, and there's, uh, going into what we're about to read, I want to remember a couple of, uh, a couple of points that Jesus has just made. He has talked about a couple of different needs in the kingdom. Um, in verses 7 through 9, he says, Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptations, uh, temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into the hell of fire. Um, and forgive me, I, I missed the, um, the, the, the context verse, verse 6 at the beginning. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. All right, that's what this whole passage is about. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, um, or if you're reading out of, uh, say, the King James, for example, yeah, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Um, the word translated offend here or cause to sin um, in the English standard um, is the, the word that we get our English word scandal from. So it's to... Um, uh, to be a, a stumbling block, to be a cause for stumbling uh, or a cause for temptation. And in this context, it's pretty obviously talking about sin, not talking about offense in the sense of, hey, your shirt looks ugly or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, offense in, in the terms of um, being a cause of spiritual stumbling. This, whoever does that to one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him to have this millstone fastened around his neck, be drowned in the depth of the sea. And then Jesus goes on to talk about, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. And the last couple of classes we have talked about how in this context, um, this teaching, which we've heard before, uh, is talking about the kingdom. This is not just an individual commandment, uh, like when we hear it in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says the same thing. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. Um, he's talking about our own individual personal lives, uh, that if there is something in, in my own life that is a cause of stumbling, something that tempts me to sin, uh, something that I've identified, I need to cut it out, get rid of it. In this context, in talking about the kingdom, who's greatest in the kingdom, uh, in talking about being a cause of stumbling to these little ones who believe in Jesus, um, he's talking about this in the sense of uh, what we sometimes call church discipline or disfellowshipping. Uh, and that's what we are about to read 
in verses 15 through 20. Keith? Children here. We look at verses three and four. Literal children? Is he talking about literal children when he says what he says about the child? No, no. Whoever humbles himself like this child is like the greatest in the kingdom child. of heaven. Yes. Yeah, we're, he's talking about anyone who believes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's talking he's talking about Christians. He's talking about fellow believers. Um, I don't know if novices specifically are in view here, uh, because really this, this whole discussion is about who is in the kingdom and who's great in the kingdom. Right, that's the question that opens this whole thing. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus responds by grabbing a child and saying, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So he's talking about people in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. So, yeah, this is not, not talking about literal children. Uh, those who humble themselves like children. Uh, these are the ones that Jesus is talking about. And he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me. All right, that's, that's you and me and all of us. All right. We are, we are the little ones who believe in Jesus. Uh, and Whoever or whatever um, is a source of stumbling for us, Jesus says, uh, the bit about the millstone, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened about his neck, be drowned in the depth of the sea. And then he goes on to say, you know, woe to the world for, and he's using the same word here, for offenses or for temptations to sin, causes of stumbling. It's necessary that these things come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And then he says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. So this is, this is one half of the preparation for us getting into verses 15 through 20. The Not just on a uh, uh, moral level. This is also in doctrinal too, right? I, I don't know that we could really draw a difference there. <laughs> I, well, I'm just saying, any any uh, occasion to sin, yeah. I, I'm inclu I'm being inclusive yeah. here, in other yeah. words. Yeah. Okay. That's what, the, you know, some people may distinguish. Oh, okay. I, There's just, just some camp. and not others. Yeah, Jesus doesn't draw that kind of distinction right. here. Now, so that's that's the one half. The other half is, and this is where we were left off on Thursday, is the parable of the lost sheep, beginning in verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Um, so in this context, the... The offending and sinful brother um, is a cause for stumbling, and he is also a little one who has gone astray, or a sheep who has gone astray. And Jesus is able to talk about the same person in both of these senses. And we'll see how these two senses come together once we hit verses 15 through 20. Um, but before we do that, uh, I want to 
make one last comment on the, the parable of the lost sheep. You know, we mostly finished up the parable of the lost sheep on Thursday. Um, but I want us to consider the, the background for this. And this is, I think this will give us a good foundation for moving forward. Jesus says, It is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So, our attitude concerning uh, these, any one of these little ones who has gone astray, our attitude is modeled off of the Father's attitude. I want us to turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34, and this will give us a good picture of the Father's attitude and what our response ought to be and what the shortcoming in response looks like. So this is the imagery that Jesus is pulling from when he gives this teaching in Matthew 18. Ezekiel 34, we'll start in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the with the wool, You're, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts." My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I... I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on, the, on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. All right, so that is the background for this. If it, there's, there's no doubt to any person who was raised on the prophets. There's no doubt what God's attitude is here. He is the good shepherd who seeks his straying sheep. And so whenever Jesus tells us, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. 
we get some sense for what he's talking about. But Jason? The, in this relationship, the shepherd has a purpose and the sheep have a purpose. Yeah. Right? The sheep, their purpose, the shepherd's purpose is to feed the sheep and to protect them, to ensure that they come to full maturation. Yeah. And the sheep are not to just wander about getting fat and doing nothing, right? They're, yeah. The purpose of the sheep is the sacrifice of the sheep, mm -hmm. right? To provide the fat and the wool. Mm -hmm. And so what is happening with these false shepherds here in Israel is that mm -hmm. they are taking the sacrifice from the ones who are required to give it, but they are also stealing the sacrifice of the one to whom it belongs, which is yes. God. Yes. So they are interrupting that cycle between the, the true shepherd and the sheep, right? So the, Jesus comes with a purpose to do the things in which he is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And the sheep also likewise have their purpose in, in yes. the whole thing. And that is to ensure that as we are sheep, to ensure that we provide the fat of what God is providing for us and that we provide the wool, mm -hmm. right, from what God provides for, for us. And that anyone who gets in the middle of that is stealing from the Lord and also stealing from the people. Yeah. Right? Because that's our purpose and we should find fulfillment in being able to provide the fat and the wool as is our job. It's our, it's our reasonable service, which in other places... I was just about is, yeah. to read from Romans 12, yeah, yeah, so there's... <clears throat> to interrupt that relationship is to destroy the natural order of things which God has created. And so that that's a, it's a pretty serious offense. And, yeah. and they, they basically are just doing it without any sort of, uh, you know, humility or, you know, shame or whatever have you. They steal from the people, they rob from God, and they do so all in the name of piety. Yeah.